This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, another conversation with John Morris. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. I'm Andy, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with John Morris. His new book, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, came out recently from Quirk Books. But before we get to that conversation, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off of the cover. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off of the cover. But many times, you can find discounts that go higher than that. That's right. And this month is in every month. They have a load of bundles that you can take advantage of to get deeper discounts on multiple comics from the same publishers. And this month... They have bundles from uh, DC, Marvel, and Valiant that you can take advantage of. That's right. You have discounts that are just unbelievable every single month. April is no exception. Head on over to dcbservice.com. you got to go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. That's right. Well, Andy, back in December of 2015, I had the pleasure of talking with John Morris about his, at the time, relatively new book, The League of Regrettable Superheroes. And I I think originally you and I had planned on talking with him during that summer, but there were some scheduling conflicts. This was around the time, maybe right before Heroes Con of that year, and we just couldn't work out things. And then by the time he, he recommended that, they they were doing another push on that book for Christmas, and so that we do a December interview. And you weren't able to join us on that one either. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely wanted to talk with him with this new book out now, which is the Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, which is the villain counterpart to the earlier book. Right. Yeah, and it's a neat book. It, it, yeah, it is. It's. Uh, I know both of us got copies uh, the other week, and when I got my copy that evening, I was sitting on the couch uh, and every now and again laughing out loud. And my wife would ask me why, and I would tell her the heroes' names, and so she got a kick out of some of those until that exercise got annoying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but we have a good conversation, and uh, l- let's go ahead and get to that. Yep. <laughs> I'm pleased to have back on the Comics Alternative, John Morris. His brand new book, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, came out recently from Quirk Books. John, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Eric. How are you? I'm doing well. And Excellent. When, when I saw a few months ago a uh, solicit for the new book, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, I knew then and there that I had to get you back on the show because we had such a good time talking about your first book, The League of Regrettable Superheroes. And this just seemed like a natural follow-up to that. But for those who may not have had the pleasure of reading that first book, uh, The Uninitiated, let's call them, Mm -hmm. how would you describe The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains? It is more than – a little over 100 of the strangest, wildest, most underrated, most under-acknowledged superheroes – in comic book history. These are all characters who've actually been created, sometimes by very big names, but for one reason or another, never quite made it uh, as a success, or some actually that will go on after the book has been published to be successful. 
embarrassing me slightly. Uh, and the Legion of Regrettable Supervillains very much in the same vein. We just flipped it from good guys to bad guys. Was this something you had in mind from the outset when you were working on your first book? Uh, it's the natural sequel. Uh, we had I had also pitched the idea of just doing another collection of superheroes because there are literally more than a thousand in our original list of uh, potential entries. But uh, yes, yeah, supervillains were much on the mind as we were putting together the original book. Uh, did did you find that it was more of a challenge to come up with the same kind of, uh, let's say, caliber of, of strangeness with the villains or even the, even the number of villains as it was with mm -hmm. uh, the superheroes? It is a completely different tactic because with superheroes, you're very often, although not in all cases, dealing with a character who gets more than a single appearance. Uh, and tends to have things like backstory, supporting casts and crews, uh, you know, subplots, narrative arcs. Whereas a lot of villains, especially your weirder ones, have one or two appearances or they have multiple appearances, but they're really spread out over a, a long period of time. And uh, you, you just have to take a completely different approach in how you co uh, collate the information about them. Yeah, because in in some of your chapters, and we should mention to our listeners that the way that the book is organized is that each supervillain has about, I guess, a couple of pages, usually a page of text and a page of illustration. Sometimes you devote three and even four pages to a particular supervillain mm -hmm. where you give a rundown of who they are, what their supervillainry, I guess, is all about, who their nemesis was, their superhero counterpart, the publisher, things of that sort. And from some of the descriptions, you can tell, and, and you even state outright, that these villains were one-offs, right? So they appeared in yeah. just one issue of a particular comic, and, and maybe even killed in that issue, so we never saw them again. Uh, others, you point out that they recur occasionally, but others, is, with other entries, it's not clear that these are characters uh, or villains who were in it for just the one time or that the hero sees later on more than once. And mm -hmm. it, it, it leaves things nicely ambiguous, which I guess in the world of superhero comics is something that you want. Yeah, it's something you can't avoid either when you've got, you know, dozens of creators over the course of a character's lifetime writing that character in different eras under different editors on some occasions in different publishers mm -hmm. uh you're going to get a character that's a little hard to nail down uh with some of the longer running characters and uh, for some reason angar the screamer is coming to mind even though he's not exactly a major villain uh but this is a character who's Original arc is really fleshed out. You get a lot of background about him. You understand his context. And every other appearance he ever had was kind of a joke in one way or another because he's a, he was a character who got outdated very quickly. He was an evil, psychedelic hippie. So that has a shelf life that doesn't really extend into the 80s and beyond. But uh, in writing that, the focus had to be on his original appearance because every other appearance is not really relevant to the core of the character. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Angar the Screamer, and he is someone that various Marvel heroes like Daredevil, Black Widow uh, went up against. And it, it what's noticeable in the book is that – and the same thing with your first uh, League of Regrettable Superheroes – that – as the narrative continues, your entries go from, let's say, the early days of the 30s and 40s into the modern era, um, readers will notice more and more recognizable characters and titles and situations than they would in the first half of the book. So there mm -hmm. is quite a bit of, of Marvel villains in the second half of this new book, and maybe not as many DC, maybe I'm wrong there, but it didn't seem as many, but but still a healthy number, but half of the book seems to be taken up with the Golden Age. So basically, um, super villainry until 1949. And there seemed to be a lot there that I think most readers would not recognize some of the heroes and definitely the villains. But, but that's a similar way that you had your superhero book, right? About half of it was of the Golden Age. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, I mean, these characters are far more obscure than the modern age characters ever will be. And because of the proliferation of, of superhero oriented companies back in the 1940s, I think there is a wider variety of folks who came from out of the DC Marvel tradition and therefore very unlikely you're going to see a lot of them ever come back. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to, to pick from, uh, the, the villains book, there are some DC villains in there or villains who might end up in DC comics. Green Arrow's got a folk called Bullseye. Hoppy the Marvel Bunny, who's not exactly a mainstream <laughs> DC hero, but he has a nemesis. And theoretically, even though he was published under a different company and a, it's a character who really has no um, profile today, theoretically that character could come back. But when we're, we're doing characters like uh, Dr. Voodoo, who fought uh, a character called Brad Spencer Wonder Man or uh, I'm trying to think of a, a really good one who has no chance of coming back or the puzzler who was a, a Riddler alike who fought the Black Terror. Those characters aren't going to pop back up anytime soon. And I think that gives it a completely different feel from the silver in the modern age uh, because those those are properties that are going to keep getting restamped over and over, particularly with the proliferation of TV and film. Right. You know, I, I was thinking of the villain, sadly, sadly, because mm. he was a nemesis of Plastic Man and it was a quality comic character. But DC now owns the rights to that. And who knows, maybe if DC decides to bring back again Plastic Man, maybe sadly, sadly, will <laughs> have a place alongside him. I absolutely would love to see that. They did do that back in the 70s. They brought uh, Plastic Man back under, I think, Martin Pasco was the writer and Joe Staten was the illustrator. and they created a raft of new villains that were in the theme of sadly, sadly mm -hmm. and uh, lava man and some of the other bizarre uh, villains that plastic man used to fight. And that is also part of why I focus a lot on the golden age because the, the themes and the feel of a lot of those old villains are so essential to these longer running characters. That's the kind of villain you have to have for plastic man. It has to be weird, a little silly, uh, it helps if there's a tinge of murder or menace about him, but for the most part, it has to be a comical villain. And in the seventies and, and early eighties, when they revamped him, that was a fantastic way to do it, to bring in all these absurd pun based villains. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would think with the golden age, uh, another challenge would be something else that you've noted in the book. And that is that in, in, in the dawn of superhero comics, many of the villains were, I guess we could call them common people, right? So these were rich men who were exploiting workers. These mm -hmm. were petty criminals, uh, street level thieves, uh, pickpockets, people like that, that the heroes were fighting. And so trying to find notable villains within at least the early Golden Age comics, uh, was that uh, kind of a challenge for you? Very much so. I mean, you look at Superman, who arguably start, you know, he's arguably the first superhero, but definitely starts the whole superhero phenomenon. And he's got about a year, year and a half before he meets his first supervillain. And before that, he's just fighting finks and crooked politicians and, and money grubbing misers and such. And that's pretty common for a lot of these foes, especially when World War II starts ramping up long before America is really involved. There are lots of fifth columnists, lots of foreign spies. Um, but yeah, guys in weird costumes are a little few and far between when the, when the medium gets started. Yeah. Now, now you were mentioning the menace of the Axis powers and mm -hmm. uh, that leads me to another thing that's notable about this new book is that every now and again, you pause in going through, let's say, this list, uh, this rogues, rogues gallery, if you will, by highlighting a particular theme that mm -hmm. seemed to define supervillains of a particular era. And in the Golden Age, of course, it was the Nazis. And you point out that there are a lot of villains who have some kind of link to the Nazi party, to Hitler, Germany, of mm -hmm. some sort. Uh, I, th I think in the, the Silver Age, you – Note the number of ape and gorilla villains <laughs> yeah. that are there. And, and then in the modern era, which you define from 1970 forward, it was villains with animal names, right? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we had names. to pull that one. It was beast named baddies. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. Although to be to be fair, that's really a trend that always exists in comics. We just uh, wanted to try to kind of find something that was indicative of the era that had a really wide net. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, some of these beast name baddies, uh, the blue leopard, the kangaroo, mm -hmm. magpie, the walrus, and then my favorite tapeworm. Ah, uh, yes. I mean, to, to his credit, he was invented to be gross and weird. <laughs> so uh, I'm not really revealing anything by adding him to a list of gross and weird heroes, but uh, yeah, uh, he's a villain who smells like, uh, digesting food mm -hmm. and he has a tapeworm segmented body that's that's about as gross as you're going to get another theme that i noticed throughout this book is it is actually something that you also to one degree or another point out in the superhero book regrettable superhero book and that is the predominance of clowns or clown like characters mm -hmm. and i mean you know obvious example of this of course is the joker but i mean that that's easy prey right i mean you go right. well beyond that to point out some of the clown themed uh villains yeah, I do. I have a particularly soft spot for Green Arrow's clown-based villain, Bullseye, mm -hmm. who uh, just – there there is some supreme cojones involved in painting a bullseye on your chest <laughs> and demanding that that an archer fight you. But uh, he's actually a really good idea for Green Arrow uh, because he's a character whose ego and whose personality is so much bigger than the heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's definitely one I'd love to see come back in some variety. I think also Green Arrow is probably getting a little uh, starving for, for villains considering his exposure level at the moment. Uh, but yeah, the clowns are a, a really prominent motif, I think, not just in superhero comics, but in any kind of fiction which requires a degree of menace. Clowns are a very natural fit for that because – you know, uh, it's hard to explain the clown thing because we're deep, we're knee deep in a cultural acceptance of clown phobia as being normal. <laughs> there's you hear the word clown and you immediately think something awful. There's no, there's no that childhood glee of clowns. It means it's a party. But when you go back to the 19th century and earlier, when before we had the pop cultural association of clowns with evil. Uh, you've got clowns as mocking characters or as protagonists in larger stories or as uh, uh, Commedia dell'arte exaggerated characters whose uh, vices and peccadilloes ruin their lives and the lives of others and cause great calamities. So that's what these clowns are coming out of the tradition from. They're coming out of the actual narrative roles of clowns in fiction and culture. Now, in fact, uh, it, it, as you were mentioning this, I opened up your previous book, League of Regrettable Superheroes, and turned to the hero, the clown, mm -hmm. uh, who originated in Spitfire Comics from Harvey in 1941. And so, you know, they're, they're, not only do we have clowns on the, the, the bad side, the darker side, but we have clowns on the good side. And I was wondering what would it be like if, let's say, the – uh, Spitfire Comics, the clown hero confronted someone like a bullseye or Uzi the clown. There's actually even a uh, supervillain called the clown who fought uh, <laughs> fought the superheroic Magno and his incredibly poorly nicknamed sidekick Davy. Magno and Davy. Um, <laughs> it sounds like yeah. a Sunday morning religious show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Davy. Clown is a Nazi. Um it's, I suppose it depends on the era, but the one thing you could probably count on seeing is a lot of uh, humor and carnival and gag-based weapons, which sounds really exciting now that we say it out loud. <laughs> I would actually love to see just two clowns alternating with, I don't know, toxic cream pies and exploding whoopee cushions. It'd be a fantastic comic book fight. Yeah. I actually kind of want to... I kind of want to see a contemporary good clown versus evil clown book. I don't know who to call. I got Jeff Parker on my Twitter. I'm going to go holler at him. Yeah, yeah. See if there's uh, any any chance of the clown confronting the clown. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, now, you were mentioning that depending on the era, era we have a humorous uh, take on a particular villain like a clown-like figure – 
or not. In doing your research for this new book, did you find a particular period that was ripe, more ripe than others, with this humorous twist when it comes to the villainry? It's definitely the Silver Age, and that has almost everything to do with Batman oh, yeah. and uh, the CBS television show and, and its prominence of villains. And for that matter, with the uh, the work of Spring and Finger and uh, Robinson on Batman, because Batman only spends about his first three years being a really grim, uh, gothic, Grand Guinal kind of comic, and then evolves into – what we think of as that kind of silly silver age feel, but that really dates back into the mid forties. Um, so yeah, when 66 comes along and Batman really reinvigorates the entire comic book medium and superheroes as a genre and lends all this additional profile to villains, creating wild campy villains becomes a real, uh, motive, uh, and, and a, a modus operandi for uh, comic book writers and editors at the time. And they're in a real rush to create the next big camp creature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that leads me to uh, a, a, an observation. And that is since your book uh, from a couple of years ago, the league of regrettable superheroes, mm -hmm. it seems that there has been more attention paid to the more wacky side of the genre um, you know, earlier this year, Craig Yo published uh, the first and what I guess will be two volumes because the second one is going to be coming out uh, later this year, and that is Super Weird Heroes. Mm -hmm. now, now, his book is different in that instead of writing about the heroes, he actually includes uh, okay. an example strip, a story of, of, of the heroes, right? So it, it's different from the kind of thing you do. Uh, but I'm also thinking about another book that is going to be coming out – within uh, the next two or three weeks, and that is Michael Urie's Hero A Go Go, where he looks right. at campy comic books and crime fighting. Uh, and so now now his is much more centered on, I guess you can call it the swinging 60s, right, at the height, right. height of camp, and, and, but even in the years leading up to Batman 66. Um, but your reach is well beyond what Yuri and Yo's is in that you're looking at the whole sweep of comics history. Right. I'm trying to create more of a, a, a holistic narrative, although I'm, I'm really looking forward to Yuri's book. And of course, Craig Yo, uh, has a long history producing, um, not really sure what to call them. His studio has been really important in keeping alive a lot of golden age, characters and concepts and keeping them, uh, creating an awareness in the contemporary audience for them. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I am trying to craft like a larger narrative or an interweaving narrative of creations and characters and creators, uh, by taking the longer, longer view of them in league of regrettable superheroes. It was very much about telling this story about Otto Binder and Joe Simon and the, how they were affecting, really the shape of the silver age into the 1970s and about Jerry Siegel's arc um, going from the greatest superhero and the best known character in the superhero genre all the way down to these really obscure heroes and characters he was working on, which is a narrative thread I'm keeping in regrettable supervillains. I'm still talking about Jerry Siegel quite a bit in that book. Oh, yeah. He comes up quite a number of times, as well mm -hmm. as other names that readers would recognize like Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, mm -hmm. people like that. Yeah, Kirby probably could uh, could foster an entire two volume set of weird heroes and weird villains all by himself. Bl well, bless his heart. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, I mean, have you considered the possibility in the future of doing a book that is more, let's say, creator or artist centered? That would be fantastic. Let me write that down real quick. <laughs> I'll send that off to my editor. Yeah, actually, I would I would really love to talk more about the arcs of of, of creators who were really heavily involved uh, in the weirder side of comics. Robert Kaniger might be a, a great example because this is a fellow best known uh, for his creation of the Metal Men, for his work on the war comics that DC was really famous for for about 20 years. But – he also created the bouncer and he also created all of the weird supervillains and the weird stories that happened in wonder woman silver age run. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's arcs to tell 
I think the Jerry Siegel one is incredibly compelling to the degree that that sort of deserves its own book as far as I'm aware or as far as I'm concerned, because his his story is sort of the undermining story of comics and the tension between creators and corporations that has defined it since the 1940s. Yeah. Well, you know, let's back up a bit and talk about what brought you to pop culture and comics in particular with the these two projects, the League of Regrettable Superhero or the Legion of Regrettable Superheroes and the or the League of Regrettable Superheroes and the <laughs> Legion of Regrettable Supervillains. I do um, that all the time. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, well, well you're the author so you can do that. Uh you're you're permitted that. Um I mean so so I remember you telling me uh, not quite two years ago when we spoke on the podcast about your growing up in a household where your parents had a lot of comics. And so that was your introduction to comics. But as a writer, what brought you to write about the kind of strange side of the superhero genre? Uh, well, I discovered just about a month ago that my blog, Gone and Forgotten, is coming up on its 20th anniversary this year. Mm-hmm. So that puts me back in 1997. Uh, I think we hadn't quite come up with the term blog yet. Right. You were, you were blogging before there was blogging. Yeah. I was, all of my, all of my individual pages had a dot HTML extension because I was just writing them and posting them. That seemed so primitive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when I was starting to write about it, I first off found it, I think a lot more interesting, a lot easier to write. Uh, about weird comics or failed comics because you can really pin down uh, something that defines something that has failed. It's not always easy to talk about how something manages to continue a cycle of success, but you can certainly say, well, this had, you know, uh, the wrong artist writer combination came out at the wrong time. There were too many other books on the racks. It's pretty easy to, to nail down what's when something came short uh, but as I was looking around, there were a lot of sites talking about comics. Very often they were shrines to a single character or a single creator, sometimes a company. But for the most part, they were really popular characters, popular books. Uh, you know, you saw a lot of Batman shrines and a lot of Wolverine shrines. Uh, and I just thought it would be more interesting to talk about the stuff that nobody was talking about. So that puts me in the company of two or three other creators at the time who were doing the same thing. I think Sean Baby might even have preceded me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the name of your your blog, Gone and Forgotten. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which at least once a month, I think I would I get a comment from somebody saying, "This character isn't forgotten. I remember him." <laughs> Which you know, I do too, buddy. I wrote an article about him. So at at what point in working? You know, as a blogger and someone who has a keen appreciation of popular culture, did it dawn on you? You know, I can turn part of what I'm doing into a book, eventually becoming the the incredible <laughs> superhero one. I have been wanting to make a book out of this probably well since a little before the This American Life interview, mm-hmm. which was 2001, I think, uh, and I was just desperate to do it. I didn't really know how to handle all the licensing and the rights issues, but it seemed like a really exciting opportunity. And I, I felt like I had a good voice for it and a good sense of perception and, and some respect for the material. Um, and so the, the interview came out and I thought, hey, all right, we're going to get, uh, we're going to get some publisher offers rolling in. And, uh, 14 years later I did. <laughs> it took a while, <laughs> took a little while. Uh, but they they rerun that episode fairly frequently, and and finally I had a publisher hear it and contacted me, and ta da, was able to put a book together. Wow, yeah. So that that um, uh, interview on This American Life was what two thousand one? I think it was two thousand one. Yeah, yeah. So it eventually Got, led to something. <laughs> well, it it launched John Hodgman, I think. So at least oh, one thing came out of it. That same episode. That same episode, Hodgman was on it, and Chris Ware was on it. Wow, you were in good company, my friend. I was in great company. Hodgman's uh, Hodgman's bit was a really interesting. If you don't mind me re- rehashing something not related to the book, oh sure. Uh, but he asked the question of people. He said, "If you could only, if you had a choice between two superpowers, invisibility or the power of flight, which would you choose?" And he said, "Whatever you chose tended to say a great deal about you." And I'll go ahead and put that question to you, Derek. If you could choose between invisibility and flight. 
You know, I, I'd be uh, hard pressed to choose one over the other because I can see the benefits of invisibility, mm-hmm. but then I think, you know, once I chose invisibility, I'd want to fly. So I don't think I'd be happy whatever decision <laughs> I would make. I think I found uh, what I learned from from Ira Glass was that I was the only person who picked one for an altruistic reason. That normally, if you pick invisibility, it's so you can steal things, and if you pick flying, it's so you can save money on airfare. That's the and reason was, people give to save money on airfare. I just did a Google talk and I asked at one point the entire room, you know, which they would choose and a, probably the vast majority of the room picked flying. And then when I asked them, would you primarily use it to save on on travel time and airfare? Most of them raised their hands again. OK, it's their thing. I said I would join search and rescue and emerge and a volunteer fire crew. Because you could you know, like fly over trees, find people lost in the woods, fly up to the tall buildings, uh, you know, upper floors are on fire. Uh, apparently, I'm the only person in Ira Glass's experience who who said something that would benefit people. Uh, well, congratulations, <laughs> you stand out. I like I like to be the the one go to guy for taking superpowers seriously. <laughs> and, and, and you know that brings us back to your books because I mean you do take this genre seriously. Where it's I mean even even given the approach that you take, it would be easy I think for people to kind of laugh this stuff off. But I mean you're mm-hmm. you're quite serious about it, and, and I think even more important is that you bring. Um, a warm appreciation of what this genre, the heroes as well as its villains, brings, right? So you don't do it in a mocking way, but you do it in a way with quite a bit of tenderness, even the villains. Uh, that's that's something I definitely had to learn. Uh, back in the early days of the blog, it was kind of a snark point and laugh kind of, of blog. Uh, but yeah, over the years, I've really come to respect – a lot of the creators more than anything else and the ideas that power these and sometimes just the sincerity of the creations. Mm-hmm. You know, it's wonderful that you look at a character like I was going to run for a hero. Let me take a quick look at the book. Uh, <laughs> I think let's run for animal, vegetable, mineral man. Okay. Which is one of the more absurd villains who faces off against the doom patrol, a team that's known for its absurd villains. Um, and this is a character that was created in utter sincerity. It's got a ridiculous name. He's far too powerful, but he gets a, a pretty compelling backstory and he's treated with some sensitivity and his defeat isn't really just a matter of beating him up bad enough that he's, he fails. It's about figuring out his real motive. It's finding a way around his powers. It's a really engaging story, even if it's a kind of silly supervillain. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another villain that is a part of the Silver Age in, and in your book is the Crimson Raider. And you start off that entry by asking the question, is it possible to pity the villain? And then the rest of the entry uh, largely addresses this issue, giving us mm-hmm. context and why there's something quite tragic about the Crimson Raider. Yeah, there actually that's not uncommon with – even your sillier villains is very often there's something kind of tragic about them. Comics are at least until about the eighties when cruelty for cruelty's sake became the mantra of so many of so many of the uh, oppositional characters. But villains come from bad beginnings very often in a way that even if it's not sympathetic, it's comprehensible or it's understandable. And it says a lot about human nature, at least like from the perspective of these writers who deal largely in aspirational fiction, which is that it takes something difficult or it takes something unfortunate to turn somebody uh, into someone who doesn't care about the well-being of others or who cares only about their own. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're starting to do – uh, like deeper dives into specific villains in your book. So, mm-hmm. you know, what I want to do now is something that you and I did the last time you were on the show where we went through the book and I asked you to point out a couple of the superheroes in each era, the the golden, the silver, and the modern, that really stand out to you or you think are the most notable or most resonant with you. Uh, and I want to do the same thing again because your, your book is divided into the 
three sections, the Golden Age, which is 38 through 49, and then the Silver Age, which you dis- define as 1950 to 1969, and then there's yeah. the Modern, so that's 1970 to the present. So we start off in the Golden Age. What villains mm-hmm. – give me a couple of the super villains that you think are the standouts in that section. I am uh... – There's a few that I think are standouts because they're very prominent, big, bold, and brash, and they they get a lot of attention. King Killer uh, is definitely one of those. This is a normal – this is a Will Eisner creation, so it's always got a lot of pathos in the backstory. (laughs) But it's a a normal, timid, meek little fellow who's abducted by two horrible uh, evil scientists who literally pack his brain – with the brains of 50 of the greatest criminals America has ever seen and make him grow into a monster size. And it's, it's a, it's a nice oversized, exaggerated, absurd villain. One of his plots is that he forms a rogue American state, (laughs) which I don't understand how that's a plot and not merely like civic engineering, but, um, and he's, you know, he's got this grim, grisly, Look, his head is full of scars. It's a good, powerful, strong visual, which a lot of the Golden Age characters had in abundance that I'm not even sure that today, where we're very aware of character design, uh, is really matched because it was so primal and raw and a little immature, which is a great connector to these more you know primal feelings we have when we deal with issues of good versus evil. So I like those those big, bold ones from the 40s, but there's also... Uh, some that have really, I don't want to say insidious, but they have tones that run under the character that make them very understandable. I'm thinking about Vita the Cobra Woman, okay. who is an Orientalist character. She's a uh, she's a seductress, murderess from uh, India. But when you actually read her story, she's basically bought like a piece of furniture and brought over to the United States by this wealthy man who's taking advantage of her. And then his son takes advantage of her. And yeah, he's, she's killing them with this sort of mad eyed fascination of the serpent. And she's using poison lipstick and it's a seduction leading to death. But I see her point. I absolutely understand why she's doing this. Uh, And that's something that, because there's unspoken um gosh i'm really i'm really stuck on how to say this we have in any given era like the dominant culture and then everything that's under uh running under that culture mm-hmm. for those people who don't have a voice in it uh and in the 1940s you know this is a fairly mainstream culture you're not going to get a lot of women's voices this is before the war effort so there's not like the huge uh, industrial presence or business presence of women in the U S and, uh, there's not a very strong non-white narrative. If there is, it's an integrationist narrative. So you have here a a woman, an Indian character, and basically a, a character who suffered human trafficking voices that I don't think you would hear at all in the 1940s. And even though this isn't written by someone who has that experience, uh, you understand that her experience is very sympathetic and maybe an even reasonable explanation for double homicide. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the first two examples that you point out in the Golden Age section are both from quality comics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Veda, the the Cobra Woman, was created by Vernon Hinkle and debuted in Police Comics in 1942. And then, as you mentioned, King Killer, the creation of Will Eisner – in Quality Comics, uh, Uncle Sam Quarterly in 1941. Nicely done. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks, thanks to your book because <laughs> you know one of the things that you do in all of the entries is you give you know uh, not only a rundown of the villain but who they're an enemy of, their main protagonist mm-hmm. or antagonist for them, I guess, who created them, what issue and year and company they debuted with, and then a little comedic – Commentary. So, for instance, with Vita the Cobra Woman, uh, what she will work for, scale, 
Yeah, that's Da-dum. a terrible joke. Yeah, that's a terrible joke. But the fact that you knew writing that that it was a terrible joke kind of makes up for that. Um, and then with Kid <laughs> Killer, uh, you also mention the his line of succession is Prince Pickpocket, Princess mm. Purse Snatcher, Baron Burglary, <laughs> Earl of Parking, uh, and a handicap spot. So, I mean, there is quite a bit of humor that is woven throughout this book. I like to think so. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I do think with the villains, I actually try to be a little more serious than I was in the first book. And I think a lot of that is what I was talking about earlier about having some sympathy for what it takes to break somebody enough to make them a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then along with that, what you were just saying a little while ago with uh, Veta, the, the Cobra woman is that many of these villains that you highlight in the book are others in one form or another, right? So they're for right. some kind of community uh, that doesn't have the same kind of voice as, let's say, most Americans would have within the context of, of, of their time. And so right. that may lead you to, to treat them in a way that is, let's say, um, less fun-making than you handled with uh, the superhero book. Yeah, there's not as much liberty, I think, to to play wild and loose with sort of the extremes of the character, both because villains like you, we mentioned before, sometimes only appear once and they're not the stars of the book. So they don't get all the attention. So they have a, a narrower pool of uh, experience and events to draw from when you're dealing with a superhero, even a short lived one, like the, the Android captain Marvel who could split all his limbs apart. <laughs> he still has five comics, I think to his name, mm -hmm. Uh, fat man, the human flying saucer has three. That's plenty of time to get a lot of, to really figure out the boundaries of the character and how you can push them and where to put them. But with a supervillain who's only appearing in one third of a single story that's largely given over to the hero, then I think you have to be a little more like earnest and sincere in approaching them. Yeah. Um, but there's but there's still a lot of humor and, and one of the things that I did when I got my copy of the Legion of Regrettable Supervillains is actually what I did when I first got a copy of your earlier book. Uh, I was sitting with my family and I, they were doing I don't know like watching TV or doing something and so I was just silently flipping through the book and every now and again I would mention something like usually a villain's name like mm -hmm. Doctor Dracula and then I would laugh. And uh, sometimes my family would ask me more questions. Sometimes they would ignore me. And then eventually <laughs> they would say, can you please stop that? We're trying to watch the news. Um, but I think, I think I piqued my wife's attention when I said, oh, get the name of this villain, Falstaff. And she yep. said, what? And I said, yes, a villain based on Falstaff. We say based on. Well, <laughs> yeah. Or he dresses as. Yeah, that's the weirdest thing. He dresses like Falstaff. He, of course, calls himself Falstaff. He's fighting a, a hero called the Green Llama, which has nothing to do with <laughs> Shakespeare or literature in any way. And then he's he's a toy themed villain, which has which makes no sense whatsoever. I'm still delighted by that. Toy themed villains are a really good idea, especially against really incredibly powerful heroes like the Green Llama was. He was more or less a, a Captain Marvel Superman type. Um, but uh, there's nothing in Shakespeare's Falstaff that makes you think this is a man who would use uh, a stuffed giraffe as a weapon. And did Ra he, rather, I was gonna say, did Falstaff appear in that one issue of Green Llama, Green Llama number five, and that's it? Yeah, he, uh, he actually sent me on a merry chase because every record I could find online said he had two appearances and I couldn't hunt down the second one. When I finally did, it was just a reprint of the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he only has really the one appearance and they never expand on the connection why he's calling himself Falstaff, but, you know, hucking toy fire trucks at people. <laughs> Oh, uh, so okay. So you've you've given me a, a couple of examples of standout villains from the golden era. In, any others mm -hmm. in the golden era? Because you know, as I mentioned, uh, that time takes up about half of the book. So you spend a right. lot of time uh, from nineteen thirty eight to nineteen forty nine. Colossus A D twenty sixty twenty six forty, yeah, is another great one because he's one of those very few villains who is the star of his own comic. 
the the book is even named Colossus Comics, and he gets to be the hero, or sorry, he gets to be the title character, uh, which is something he shares in common with the Black Tarantula, who's actually the narrator of his only appearance. I I like that too because since there were no rules yet about how to do a superhero comic, just making the villain the focal point was perfectly reasonable. It was seemed at least something worth trying. You know th- that that's a good point you bring up about the Black Tarantula. He and Colossus AD twenty six forty. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, you know, they do have their own titles, but but another thing that stands out with the Black Tarantula, again, another uh, Golden Age villain, is that he does narrate his own story. And this, I would guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, is is one of the reasons you chose to provide more page space for this particular villain than with others. Because with I think with most entries, we have a page of text where you give the background, the information, all you know, all the, the core nuggets. Uh, and then we have a an art sample uh, on a second page. And it could be a mm-hmm. cover or it could be an interior uh, page from the comic. But then there's some villains, just as you did in the superhero book, where you give them two or three more pages to kind of breathe, so to speak, so we can see more of them in the comics and learn right. more facts about them. So was part of the reason that you gave the Black Tarantula – I guess I should call him – is it the Black Tarantula or Black Tarantula? Uh, it's a TB Tarantula, I believe is his full name. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons I think why you may have given Black Tarantula more page space is to show more of the comic where he actually does become a narrator, where he's looking at us, the reader, as he's about mm-hmm. to tell us his story. There were also there was a lot of striking imagery in that story as well. Uh, one of the first full page illustrations you'll see is a, a horrible red monster that he summoned to destroy a medieval town, and it just it looked too good to not put it in. Mm-hmm. But we are also we run into a, again another problem with the villains. Uh, the villains aren't going to appear on the cover, and the villains aren't necessarily going to even appear on the splash page. And you might only get the villain. Like, say, the dude. This was a character I had a lot of trouble finding a single image to run with <laughs> because he was always in little fractional panels. He's on a two-third page splash. That was the best find I could make. Right. Uh, and he's a fun character, and I really wanted to show off more of his evil costumes, his his wardrobe of doom. But couldn't really do it because there was only so much to show. So when we did come across someone that had really powerful, big – uh, engaging visuals. I, it was definitely worthwhile putting in a few more images. So you could get a, you could really drink them in. Right now, it, we should mention to our listeners that you, you're talking about the dude. This is not Jeffrey Lebowski. We're talking about right. Here. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is the nemesis or one of the nemesis uh, nemeses of Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. Yes, uh, I'm so glad I was able to get him in too because I was. My editor uh, and I on my first book had two real battles about entries, and one of them was Bullet Man and Bullet Girl. I wanted them in the book so badly Mm -hmm. because, you know, besides inventing a a special metal helmet that allowed them to fly, the the metal helmet also attracted bullets, which is the opposite of why you wear a helmet. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But uh, he wouldn't let me put them in because he felt they were too – still too well known. And uh, so that I was able to fit them in here uh, into the villain book by profiling one of their their enemies was really rewarding. Um, but yeah, he's he's a character who is the incredibly dapper dressed man. If he murders somebody, he will fix their tie and their jacket lapel so they look nice because he won't leave a man looking disheveled. That's kind. That is very nice of him. And uh, he does in his very first appearance because it's the pun you all go for. Uh, he is he is referred to as the man who is literally dressed to kill, <laughs> and I I love him to pieces. I just made him a focal point of the Google talk I did the other day, because it's such a charming conceit and a, a great idea for a character to have like an acid spewing boutonniere and darts that fire out of your cufflinks or a cane that can shoot flames. But again, ran into a lot of trouble finding ways to really exp- like visually express that information. 
Okay, so let's move on to the the Silver Age. So between uh, nineteen forty or nineteen fifty and nineteen sixty nine, what are two or even three, if you want to throw in a third, of <laughs> the villains that you feel have the most impact on you as a researcher writer? Mm. Uh, well, Egg Fu is <laughs> one of the better known goofy villains. And he's the he's sort of the one I had to tackle, not just because he's so absurd, but because you have to deal with how so much of the absurdity of these characters uh, was motivated by our cultural fears at the time. Or what I'm trying to say is he's immensely racist, right? Just tremendously racist. And it becomes such it's such a, a, a Sisyphean task that people keep trying to bring him back and revamp him when just let that go. He's never not going to be a racist character. Um, but he's he's pretty indicative of probably about 100 other villains I decided to skip on because Egg Fu covers the bases. You've got a giant yellow uh, egg with a prehensile Fu Manchu mustache and he reverses his R's and his L's. You, you've hit the apex right. of what you can tell these ones. Yeah, you know, there, there's something about – I mean, you know – they were able to bring back Ebony White in subsequent uh, spirit stories, you know, after Eisner, and mm. make it palatable, right? Make it okay. I don't. Th- I, I'm with you. I don't think that there's any way you can bring back Egg Fu <laughs> in in a way that is not going to be even indirectly uh, potentially offensive. Yeah, that when Grant Morrison brought him back in in DC's weekly series Fifty Two. It all worked for a very long time. He was a he was a weird alien. They used uh, the the eyes and the mouth were actually just cracks in the egg, and he had these horrible teeth behind it. He had a cyborg spider thing. It was all very good and very exciting until he even he didn't go under the name Egg Fu. But when somebody called him Egg Fu, then we're out. Because now you've got a yellow egg shaped Chinese supervillain and you're calling him egg foo. <laughs> That's it. You're done. You've you effed up your attempt to rehabilitate the character and it's time to shut it down and try again later. Or not or never try again, ideally. So you felt that you definitely had to visit Egg Fu in this book mm-hmm. and also use him as maybe a representative figure of others, other villains that were ethnic and racial stereotypes, egregiously so. <laughs> Egregiously so. He's he's good for the Silver Age. I hit another one in the Modern Age section, if you don't mind me jumping ahead a little bit. Oh, sure. Uh, who's named Ghetto Blaster. <laughs> who's, I know. And his power was that he blasted ghettos. And I, I, I wanted to include him as well as Egg Fu because Egg Fu was – the best you can suggest is that Robert Kaniger, who invented him, was, was being blithe. And the worst case scenario is he was being – horribly racist with with ghetto blaster uh created by mike Barr, i believe this is a character you could tell that Barr's heart was in the right place he wanted to tell a story about the the terrible state of america's urban inner city areas but he created a villain called ghetto blaster to do it who went around blasting up the ghetto and everybody who lived there loved him because he was blasting the ghetto even though that's where they lived and you can't you can't really separate it from that complaint you often have when there is a riot in an inner city area and uh, very comfortable people watching it on their television will just snidely say, oh, why are they why are they destroying their own stuff? They they should. You wouldn't see me destroying my house because I'm upset. And it feels like Barr was channeling that and he was trying to make it a positive thing, but it. It came out really condescending and awful. So Egg Fu and Ghetto Blaster end up being two sides of the of the racist supervillain coin, and, and ideally I only needed to discuss that twice. You know, that's interesting because I remember one of the things you and I discussed the first time you were on the Comics Alternative uh, for the superhero book was this – I think I guess something similar, right? So even with good intentions, when mm-hmm. creators, let's say, you know, primarily middle-aged or older white males uh, from a fairly privileged or at least comfortable background, attempt to let's say represent uh, a minority culture of some way, whether it be race, ethnicity, gender, or what have you, 
in in such a way that they attempt to to be sympathetic to them, they do it in a way that is uh, ultimately demeaning and belittling and objectifying mm-hmm. uh, when it comes right down to it. So even with good intentions, you get this not only with the villains but with uh, the heroes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's This always ends up being a fight, particularly if you're on Twitter uh, or Tumblr where creators end up having to sort of defend themselves for writing or creating a character who doesn't look like they do, mm-hmm. you know? So you get, you get those middle-aged white male creators who are getting criticized for, for having a character that who is a woman or who is a person of color, uh, and so on. And the, the argument becomes writers insisting, well, you have to be able to write characters who don't look like you or else it becomes a really sameish looking environment and you have their critics saying that's fine but you don't want to write a story that talks about what it's like to be one of those people if you don't know it if you don't have that experience right and that's a frisson that exists between the audience and the authors that still seems really un- uncomfortable which is strange you think it's a pretty easy idea to grasp but still a fight yeah and you know it's an interesting inversion of that is if you have writers and since we're talking about comics here writers on a team right so it could be the artist it could be a writer a colorist or what have you mm-hmm. um on well okay so if you have let's say an an african american writer you would expect him or her to write about a character, a hero, or what have you from an African American experience, mm-hmm. but that assumption is also really pigeonholing what they're able to do with their art. Yeah. Well, that's that, that thing that any culture, any subculture that's been othered uh, in the mainstream culture end up really unfairly having to be ambassadors for their entire group. Right. Every time they do it, everything they do. So, Every time you – if you're a black creator, you create a black character, then you are representing all black characters and all black creators every time, everywhere. And that's grossly unfair, but probably also so baked into the culture that we're a couple decades away from that disappearing. Right. And and you're hearing this now, listeners, from uh, two middle-aged white males. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Sitting sitting on a comfy chair, my little pink ass, and just really commenting on all society from my perspective. Hi. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so what's uh, another villain in the Silver Age section of the book that you particularly were drawn to? There's there's a couple I do want to tackle. I want to hit Elasto real quick. Okay. Uh, Because this was a Jerry Siegel creation. He was briefly writing – uh, the shadow for for Archie Comics uh, when they they purchased the rights to do the old uh, you know pulp hero the shadow but they did him as a, a garish super spy in a spandex costume anyway <laughs> uh, Elasto was a former FBI agent who was conducting an experiment that blew up in his face gave him the power to stretch. Uh, and also turned him evil, but not so evil that he enjoyed being evil. Just he was compelled to be evil, and then he would apologize and complain about it. And it was it's a genuinely charming character. He introduces himself by saying, uh, "My name is Elasto, and the first thing I need you to know about me is that I hate myself." <laughs> and I I love it because Jerry Siegel was a guy who had you know a very tumultuous experience in comics. Uh, he and Schuster were, I, I think we're at the the point we can say objectively were taken advantage of by Jack Leibowitz. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, even if you're being as fair as you can be and say, you know, Siegel was a contentious character and maybe was not easy to get along with, his career was really pockmarked with a lot of disrespect and a lot of misfortune. But he does seem to be having a lot of fun with these third tier characters that he's writing under a pseudonym. I think he's got three villains in this book, in fact. Um, and I wanted to include a fourth, which I couldn't justify because he only appeared in two panels, but it was a villain called the vegetable. Oh, you has, write about that on your blog, don't you? I just wrote about it this week on the blog. Yeah. He's basically a, a pickle with a, with heads on with a, <laughs> a head, arms and legs. And he's supposed to be vegetable themed, but he debuts throwing an apple shaped hand grenade and has a banana shaped getaway car. And it's goofy beyond belief, but 
it's really appealing and he's clearly just enjoying himself. And I, I like those characters a lot. He also has Phantasmon. That's the, the wizard that can shoot lightning out of his nostrils. Uh, he's, he's got a character called ugly man, which actually ties into the other characters. I really think stand out. And the ugly man is basically just a young up and coming actor. Who's trying to murder all of his competitors and a fear of youth uh, especially a fear of youth uh, overcoming the establishment is a pretty solid character type in the 1960s in the Silver Age. Mm-hmm. So you've also got Sinistro Boy Fiend, which is a Charlton Comics creation. Who uh, he's an all-American boy. He should be a superhero by all rights, but he thinks that superheroes are ganging up on poor, underpowered gangsters. So he becomes a superhero that only defends bad guys. <laughs> and that's that is definitely a middle-aged man looking at oh those teenagers they'll do anything to be contrary and making a villain out of it there's another uh, villain named tino the terrible teen who is uh basically an elvis presley character but uh is also you know just furious with the generation that preceded him and completely ungrateful and wants to destroy them i i like that there was an entire era where people who were trying to write comics that would be sold to young people were making villains out of young people. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when, when you mentioned that it reminded me of, uh, again, this period that we've discussed before on this interview, and that is, uh, you know, the, the late 1960s, especially, mm-hmm. uh, superhero dumb post, uh, Batman 66. Now, uh, Sinistro boy fiend is a Charlton comic creation. And there are other Charlton, uh, villains in this book, but, uh, you also mentioned Ugly, and he was an Archie uh, right. creation. And then we also have a number of Harvey comic creations. And I'm not talking about the, you know, like the Richie Rich villains and whatnot. Um, but there was a time, and, and I think it's easy for for readers uh, and those who are into comics to forget this. But there was a time in the late 1960s when, again, after Batman '66 superheroes were kind of a hot thing, right? So publishers mm-hmm. who really hadn't touched it much uh, for maybe a couple of decades tried once again to bring back some kind of superhero line. And Archie and Harvey were two publishers who attempted to do this, but they did it within the spirit of the the campiness of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Harvey Thriller line, which uh, I really admire because – they weren't trying to revive their 1940s heroes. They went and created a whole new mass of heroes. Uh, but that was definitely all meant to be hyper campy. And it had Otto Binder and Joe Simon on creative duties. So it, it really didn't have a choice except to be really campy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, yeah, when Archie revives itself, it takes all of the characters that it had started off with in the 1940s and who had been completely eclipsed by the popularity of Archie. Uh, and tried to revitalize them for the new era. And they went from being just sort of bog standard 1940s superheroes into being what they considered to be hip and swinging and (laughs) coy. Uh, The Shield, I believe, was unemployed and was actually just wandering from town to town looking for small jobs. Uh, The Web was the henpecked hero, which I think is the best idea that came out of that group. And that was basically a sitcom character whose wife didn't want him to do any more superheroing because it was so dangerous and it was really hell on laundry. And he he would sneak out at night with when his uh, they had storylines about his mother in law visiting. I think these are those were immensely entertaining, mm-hmm. uh, and they did produce some memorable and very strange villains out of out of that new generation of of hip reiteration. Yeah, I know one of my favorite villains in the book from this kind this this phenomenon that we're de- describing is Generalissimo Brainstorm, which was <laughs> from Harvey Comics in 1966. Especially the way the sound effects that come from his power, which he calls the, the Crackle Command, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, snap, crackle, and pop. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that those are the sound That's effects. It. Yeah, and there's there's. I do like that there's a little build up to it in his appearances because he'll appear and you'll get like a snap crackle, 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 
snap pop crack, and then all of a sudden snap crackle pop just really out of the gate making sure everybody gets the joke yeah and basically that's the sound of i guess his brain working so he's mm-hmm. thinking also there's mind control and telepathy going on as well yeah of course with little red <laughs> stars floating around his head <laughs> i do absolutely adore the visuals on it. it's always one of the things that um delights me about comics is the way that they're able to give uh, a visual body to something that is effectively invisible. <laughs> like even up through the nineties and you're getting characters like Psylocke with her psychic knife, uh, that they're able to give that a visual is just incredibly entertaining to me. Okay. So let's, let's look to the modern age. So from 1970 to the present, uh, what are a couple of the villains that you, I know we've talked about a, a couple already, but what are two more, let's say that really stand out for you? The, uh, the modern age is such a cheat because we go from 1970 to today, which is of course, almost 50 years where the other groups are about 10 years apiece. So it's a little bit of a cheat. Um, I would say there's two, types of villains that define this era for me. And one of them is the fad based villain. And this is just whatever is panicking people at the time gets a villain made out of it. So there's probably no better example of this than swarm, uh, swarm being a character who's clearly born out of that fear we had in the late 1970s, that killer bees were going to come up from South America Mm -hmm. and come over the Mexican border and stab us all to death. And, and this is before Donald Trump, by the way. Uh, <laughs> God, if I had only seen this coming, I could have gotten a whole new chapter out of the book. <laughs> um, you see, there was also the fear at the same time uh, that Nazis were had escaped to South America and were rebuilding the Fourth Reich down there. And so Swarm is a Nazi horticulturalist, I think horticulturalist, apiarist, who escapes to South America captures a bunch of radioactive killer bees and has them take over his body and becomes a Nazi bee man. That's a perfect just gathering of two terrible cultural phobias of the time into what is a delightful supervillain. Right. And he is a villain of Spider-Man. He's a, he starts off facing the champions, which is a, uh, a, a, at best a D lister group of superheroes and includes Ghost Rider, Angel, Iceman from the X-Men, Black Widow, and Hercules. Five characters who had no reason to hang out together, but they worked. Uh, And then he does go on to fight Spider-Man quite a bit. In fact, I have a running bet that by the third Spider-Man movie in the current franchise, uh, we will see Swarm. You think so? I don't know how. I don't know. I don't think he'll be the main villain. But I bet we're going to get a, like a sly reference to his secret identity or to his legacy or something. I'm, I got money that Swarm is going to get a mention. And, and what gives you this feeling? Are your, your spidey senses tingling or what? <laughs> he has had incursions into pop culture before. He's one of the few villains featured in this book who has an action figure. Uh, he, he had appeared on Spider-Man and his amazing friends, which I will go ahead and say is not by any means an indicator of future success <laughs> because they also fought, they also fought basically a living space invader. And I haven't seen that guy again. Uh, but I just, there's something about him that is so appealing. I really feel like swarm is almost an inevitability. Okay. So what's, what's a second standout villain from 1970 on? I think I was just really, uh, this is a real tricky one because like I say, I'm covering 50 years and I am really tempted. I'm really tempted to say snow flame and I'm torn between him and Dr. Bong. And here's why <laughs> snow flame is a South American drug dealer who gains the power to shoot flaming destructive bolts and such because he's high on cocaine. Cocaine gives him the power to shoot flames from his body. So again, something we feared at the time. This is the (laughs) mid late eighties. Yeah, this is, this is definitely a, a South American drug Lord terror. This is about tainted cocaine. This is about just the, the myth and misunderstanding of what certain drugs do to the body. Um, my wife and I were talking the other day about how 
it we used to hear the rumor that ecstasy would change your DNA, <laughs> which I, I like. I'm not a biologist. Maybe it could, but I don't think it could. And even if it could, I'm not really sure how that would manifest itself. But you hear these rumors about what different drugs will do. Cocaine is not a great drug by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think it turns you into a maniac drug lord who will shoot flames out of his hands. But on the other end of, at a, uh, end of the ruler, whatever I'm trying to say, on the other side is Dr. Bong. Now, this is a character who really clearly is a drug reference created by Steve Gerber for Howard the Duck. I guarantee you it was him and Jim Starlin and a couple other guys hanging out in their apartment making a joke about what if you had a supervillain who was like permanently attached to his bong. There was a bong accident. I promise you that's what it was. But knowing <laughs> they couldn't get that into the comic, they made him a guy with a clapper on his severed hand and a bell-shaped helmet, and he bangs it to make things magic things happen. And he just calls himself Dr. Bong. And I like I like the comparison of these two characters because by the 80s, we're a pretty literal culture. We have dropped a lot of the coy asides that have defined us. In the 70s, we're a really wry, ironic, snide, and snotty culture. These are This is when the baby boomers are really in their young adulthood, and they are acting like dicks. So <laughs> I, and I prefer that. I frankly prefer that to like just bland sincerity or clever jackassery. I will always take clever jackassery. So uh, I like those two as a good indicator of the shift of our culture from a sly drug reference that you're going to slip into a kid's comic and some of the adults who read it and the teenagers will get it and the little kids will just think it's funny to Snowflame, who's a badass who uses cocaine and everybody knows it. And, and maybe it's not as fun or as interesting. Now, you know, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that you feel that this last section on modern comics, basically from 1970 to the present, is kind of a cheat because it covers about 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, the, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, the golden era, you know, taking us up to, to 1949 in, in your definition, takes up about half the book. And then right. the Silver Age and the Modern Age sections are about equal. I don't know exactly how many pages in each, but they look about the same. Did, yeah. Even though the modern era has more – at least it covers a, a, a longer period, uh, do you feel that there aren't as many ridiculous villains beginning in the 1970s compared to what we had previously? I think it's more a case that there's uh, a much tighter stranglehold on the new comic book companies that will be doing superheroes. Um, in the 1940s, it felt like everybody with access to a printer was making comics. If you if you could run off uh, even a single issue of any anthology title filled with whatever back matter you could buy on the sly, you'd do it. Um by the time you get to the 60s, it's a much smaller field. There's still DC. Marvel has just been born. Uh, and then Charlton is going to be trying to do a comeback. Harvey will be doing its uh, its kids' comics. But, you know, at the time, DC really owned distribution for comics in a really heavy way. And they were able to kind of, you know, close the floodgates so that very few other books, particularly competitors, would come out of that. And then by the by the eighties, nineties, and and today, you know it's DC and Marvel, and you get occasionally you'll get something like Valiant will come along, or Dark Horse might try a uh, was it a comics greatest world um, experiment, but there's just not that open floodgates of wild creation from outside the mainstream. You can go look at. Uh, vanity press books and third press books. This is something I am. I started doing last year on the blog is finding all of these books published in the 1980s, just by some guy who was able to get 10,000 bucks together in Amarillo or uh, in, in Madison and put together a, a small print run of a book. That's only going to go one or two issues featuring their custom superhero. But you know, there's no real connection among the audience to those characters. Not a lot of nostalgia, which is part of really what, makes this series work. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we're just at a point now where you don't see a lot of those guys. I'm sure web comics has quite a few, but those do tend to be humor based. Um, you know, Right. And in fact, I was going to ask you about the phenomena of webcomics and not only when it comes to this this current book, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, but the earlier one on regrettable superheroes. Once you get into um, the modern period, especially later into the modern period, modern period, you get later into the modern period, then there are there's the presence of webcomics. So. One of the luxuries, if you want to look at it this way, of webcomics is that anybody can be a writer and artist and publish their own material. Mm -hmm. And many webcomic creators do have a very devoted following that I would argue is comparable to, let's say, popular audiences of print comics, especially you know from several decades ago. Um, but there seems something, to me at least, a little niche about web comics when compared to to print publications. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of issues do you wrestle with, or have you wrestled with, with both of these books regarding web comics? Well, the the writ of the of the books was always comic books. We're always looking at comic book supervillains, um, which is what we decided doing the first one when I wanted to add stuff like Captain Nice, the old NBC superhero parody show written by Buck Henry. Um, and I, I talked about a couple of, uh, of lesser known superheroes from the web. Although I felt, you know, it's, it's a case where if something comes out of DC comics, this is a multinational corporation owned by Warner. If, and they're making pretty decent money. I know they're working hard for it, but if they create kind of a silly character, I, I don't think me taking a pot shot at it is going to hurt feelings or income. Mm -hmm. But if you are, you know, some really hard struggling dude, just putting out a web comic and you're just doing it because you want to do comics and you're, you're making, you know, a portion back on your click ads, your click through rates, or maybe you sell a t-shirt or two. I feel like it would be really punching below my weight. I think it's punching below anyone's weight to take those kind of people to task. They're not the enemy, you know? Right. Yeah. Even if they're intentionally though, uh, being ironic and silly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd rather give them the room to do their stuff, mm -hmm. especially because they've done an amazing job of carving out, audiences that I don't think print comics could even ever touch or for that matter have much interest in. And I'm, I'm saying that on a really, uh, on a level of personal hurt because I remember when I was doing web comics and I was trying to make that step going from a web comic to a comic book. And it was, it was a difficult experience. Hmm. I had at the time that I, I was trying to get my, my get my web comic published I had 7,000 regular readers, which is not bad for a comic. That was better than Supergirl at the time. <laughs> and I took it to all of these publishers that, with very few exceptions, tended towards adventure, action. They had a small comedy bit, which is where I was trying to get in. And across the board, I got compliments for the work, but nobody was willing to dive in on it. And I feel that's probably what happens with a lot of webcomic creators is their stuff's really popular. They get a lot of attention, but the transition from that to a, to an actual published comic is still a real uphill climb. And I, I don't want to add to their many problems. Especially if it's something that aspires <clears throat> to be a serial. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing to have like a one-off book that you first serialize on the web and then later potentially take into a book. But if you have mm -hmm. something that appears to be ongoing and there are plans for that, that I don't think there's much track record in terms of that being successful. Yeah. I mean, it, you really look at the number of web comics that have made that successful transition and it's very low. I think PVP, mm -hmm. Uh, Penny Arcade's done some good collections, but I don't think they do a regular book. John Allison has done a terrific job of getting his uh, – doing that transition from bad machinery up to giant days. But yeah, it is still pretty limited. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. In fact, I was thinking of a serial that started off as a web comic and then ended up in a serial print. And this is uh, Kristen Gudsnuck's Hinch Girl. 
Mm, okay. And uh, I, I know that we discussed it in the past on the Comics Alternative as a webcomic. And um, I don't know, maybe it was about two years ago, perhaps a little more than that, a little longer than that. Then Scout Comics began publishing it as a serial. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it's still being published now, but uh, I think chances are good that it's not just because yeah. of the life cycle, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, you know, you, you mentioned your own experience as a creator. So you, you come to the medium not just as, let's say, a journalist or a critic, but also as one who, who writes and draws your own work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And although I have to – I still have to admit that my sympathy for other creators was something that had to grow while I was doing the blog. And – I feel like I'm arming a lot of potential internet bullies here, but it was definitely the product of having a lot of my readers who loved the works that I was, I was lambasting really read me the riot act about just taking the easy path of mocking them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it took some time to really realize that there's care and there's, there's intentional effort that goes into creating these things and if I am going to write about them, that it's got to be done from a place of appreciation of that effort, if nothing else. Mm. And we should also mention that you have uh, experience with, with podcasts as well, speaking of your work as a journalist. <laughs> yes, uh, completely unrelated to comics. I do a, a podcast about Columbo with my good friend R.J. White. And you know, I think we discussed this last time um, – because Columbo, I mean, on the one hand, for, for someone like me and for like you who grew up with Columbo, it, it makes sense. Why not? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like to me, it's like, why not have a podcast devoted to the Rockford Files? Of course you would. But but I think that a lot of people, at, at least let's say my students, uh, if I mention Columbo, most of them will give me some kind of quizzically blank stare. Sure. Yeah, we uh, we have a, a wide array of guests on the show and a lot of those include um, folks who are in their 20s or even early 30s and we ask them about what's your history with Columbo and it'll almost always be oh, I saw it on Netflix about three years ago it's, it, very different from folks who are our age we'll ask them what's your experience with Columbo and it's oh I remember like you know lying on the on the living room floor kicking my feet my parents watching Columbo it's 1975 or whatever uh, and then, yeah, kids, the modern audiences, if they know Columbo at all, they only got into him about a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, another great thing about uh, platforms like Netflix. Yeah, it's wonderful. Platforms like Netflix, digital comics, uh, assorted archives like the digitalcomicmuseum.com, which I always like to plug because it's an amazing resource. Uh, all these things that were really throwaway material that we're expected to be seen maybe once in reruns and never again has just a surprising amount of quality that we can now preserve for all time, which is fantastic. Right. Uh, and if people wanted to check out your Columbo podcast, which they should, it's called Just One More Thing. And of course, mm-hmm. fans of Columbo know why it's called Just One More Thing. Yeah, absolutely. And they can find it at, is it uh, thecitydesk.net slash Just One More Thing? That is it, or I you can use the shortcut, which is jomtpodcast.com. Okay, so definitely check that out. Even though it may not have anything to do with superheroes, it nonetheless concerns a crime fighter. So there you go. There's the connection. Oh, yeah. Nice link. I know, yes. I'm embarrassed I didn't think of it. <laughs> okay, so your book from 2015, uh, The League of Regrettable Superheroes, and then the one that just came out this year, The Legion of Regrettable Supervillains, it seems that – there is a franchise in the works here. Uh, is your next book going to be something like the the organization of regrettable sidekicks? Uh, uh, I have pitched the clubhouse of regrettable sidekicks. Oh, that's a good clubhouse. Yes. Uh, there's also a possibility, say, for the kennel of regrettable super animals, the laboratory of regrettable super monsters, and the cosmos of regrettable super aliens. We're just going to have to keep thinking. Okay. I would love to just do another – do a sequel to the first book though because there's still hundreds of superheroes that would seem to fall into the likely can- categories. Yeah, because you mentioned that you had about a, a thousand that you mm-hmm. said could have possibly been in the book, but it was just a little over a hundred. Did you have the same kind of numbers or I guess or just a fraction of that for the supervillains book? 
No, there's about a thousand for each. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that I I was putting at least as much effort into the villain book as the superhero book. Um, so yeah, there's still, although we went through the villains a lot quicker because I think it was easier to pick out the absurdity, uh, of certain ones. I was thinking about the character called the dark archer when I was doing the research on the book, looking for villains. Uh, and I flipped through the first two or three pages of him thinking, uh, it's an archer character. There's not going to be anything weird about him. And then about three, <laughs> three pages in, I realized he doesn't have a bow. He doesn't have a quiver. He just carries an arrow with him and stabs people with it. Yeah, that's so ludicrous, definitely. Oh, it's perfect. It's also great that his his hero, his opponent, the the first time we meet him, doesn't think that somebody being killed by an arrow in a high rise building is at all interesting. Yeah, his uh, <laughs> the hero is Hail of the Herald, right? So this is Hail of the Herald, and you point out that he doesn't seem like a crack reporter in that he doesn't really see things very clearly. No, he, uh, he's standing in this room with a bunch of cops over a murdered body that has an arrow in it. And he just says something blithe, like, uh, clearly there was a kid in a building across the street playing with a bow and arrow set. I don't see why this is a big mystery. So I love that. I, you can see why he doesn't, he didn't receive the Pulitzer. Exactly. Uh, and the only thing he had going for him was he could turn invisible, which, you know, that <laughs> requires a whole conversation unto itself. Yeah, well, that gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Would he fly or would he want to be invisible? Well, apparently he'd want to be in, uh, invisible because otherwise his reporting career would go down the turlet. <laughs> OK, but you, whatever books that you have in the waiting, let's say, um, that we may see over the next several years, you still want to primarily stick within the superhero genre, correct? Uh, I think it's, it's a little more fun. Uh, it wouldn't with the monster book and the alien book, which I I am pitching and I think would be good. You know, obviously that'll take me into horror and science fiction. And there's a lot of genuinely weird stories out there. I, I keep wanting to run uh, a series on gone and forgotten because the, the DC book, strange adventures alone has some incredibly bizarre, creations including you know evil snowmen who take over the planet and shoot freeze rays from their eyes well worth investigating Uh, and that's not even taking into account you know all the old timely and atlas horror books or all the the ec creations but yeah i wouldn't mind staying in superheroes i still think there are hundreds of stories to tell from this seemingly overexposed medium Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and you're but you're doing it in a way that is definitely less irritating, less say than what Marvel or DC is doing on on film and television. I mean, after a while, it reaches for me at least a saturation point. That's like, okay, enough already. Step back, give it a rest. Um, yeah, but we're not getting enough <laughs> of uh, regrettable villains and heroes. I do wish there was more, you know, corn in a lot of these. Uh, television shows and films. One of the reasons that I enjoy watching The Flash uh, is that it, I can't believe it, but they brought Gorilla Grodd to live television. Mm. I never thought you would see Gorilla City on on a major broadcast network, but here we are, and they're willing to embrace that as really charming and enjoyable. Yeah, that's something I need to get caught up with. I've seen the first season, but beyond that, I've been lax in my Flash watching. I am. Uh, I'm. Definitely looking to not be spoilered on the third season, but uh, going to be catching up on that as well. Oh, okay. Well, but first and foremost, you know, do think about this next book that you're doing, and don't take too much TV watching time uh, away from <laughs> your, your your plans. Uh, but John, I want to thank you again for being on the Comics Alternative. As last time, had a great time going over some of the wackiness of uh, the superhero genre, and I look forward to having you on again. When your next book comes out of regrettable somethings. (laughs) Thanks. I, I appreciate that. And I'll hold you to it. So that that was a, that was a fun interview, and I'm I'm glad you got a chance to talk to John about this this new book. Yeah, and maybe we can look for a series of these regrettable fill in the blank, either heroes or sidekicks, uh-huh. uh, in in the future. I hope so because this is something that he really excels at. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's good at tracking this stuff down and writing about it. Yeah. And, you know, you and I a few months ago talked with Craig Yeo about that new book of his, uh, Super mm-hmm. Weird Heroes. And, and those are good in that we get the original stories. But what John brings us in his regrettable superheroes and just recently the regrettable supervillain books is that uh, we get quite a bit of context. So he writes about them as a journalist. Right. Yeah. So great stuff. Definitely get your copy of the Legion of Regrettable Superheroes. And in fact, if I'm sorry, so go out and get your copy of the Legion of Regrettable Supervillains. In fact, if you go to the Comics Alternative website and click on our Amazon.com banner, then you'll be taken over to Amazon. You can purchase the book that way. And by doing that, you'll throw a, a few cents back to us, the Comics Alternative. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Help us out. We like that. Uh, you can also find great discounts on comics at the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com, and they will definitely take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do, get your comics there, either at DCB Service or John's book via Amazon. Get in touch mm-hmm. with us and let us know what you thought about my conversation with John Morris. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. That's right, or you can get a hold of us by, by email. We are two guys at comicsalternative.com, and you can also get a hold of us individually. I'm Andy at comicsalternative.com. And I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And we also have our Twitter feed that you can check out at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn, on Spotify, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, which is comicsalternative.com. That's right. All the ways to get a hold of us, let us know how we're doing and find out what we're doing. That's right. And we have more interviews lined up pretty darn soon, so check back for those. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Andy. See ya.